In this video, we're going to do a brief overview of the eight Ivy League universities. And in particular, we're going to focus on how they're each different. What are the pros and cons of each one that you can't find out from just going on the college websites? And it's really important to understand that the eight Ivy League schools are actually really different from one another. You know, very often students and parents lump them all together because they're part of the Ivy League and they're all really good schools. But they're quite different, not only academically, but also culturally from one another. And it's important to understand the difference for two reasons. One, because you want to make sure that you're applying to a school where you'll be happy, uh, where it'll be a good fit for your personality and your goals. And the second is that you want to make sure that when you apply to these schools, they're extremely competitive to get into. You want to make sure that you tailor your application specifically for that school. So you can't just talk in general about, oh, I want to go to a really good school and it's highly ranked and it's got a good math program. That's not enough. They're not excited about those students. These top universities want applicants who need to go to their school, who appreciate what makes that school unique, their unique programs, their unique offerings. So the more you know about what makes that school different and distinct from everybody else, the more you can tailor your application to those elements and you can stand out. Now, before we get into what makes these schools different from one another, it's important to highlight what makes them similar. And the truth is that all eight Ivy League universities are extremely prestigious. They're all insanely difficult to get into uh, with less than a 10% acceptance rate, sometimes much less than that. And if you graduate from all of them, you're really setting yourself up for success in virtually any field you want to go into. So a lot of noise is made about uh, annual rankings and Princeton is number one and Cornell is number 15 and blah, blah, blah. The point is these are all elite schools and every year students graduate from them who go on to become leaders in their field. They go on to become presidents. They go on to become, you know, CEOs. They become, you know, Nobel Prize winners, leading researchers whatever. The point is, is that if you're lucky enough to get into any one of these schools, you're doing great. You're already well ahead of everybody else. When you graduate, all kinds of doors are going to magically open for you to get into graduate school or to get internships or jobs. So don't worry too much about ranking and kind of well, which one's better or which one's worse. The truth is they're all excellent. There are students everywhere who are dying to get into all of them. So if you get into one, just really be happy. All right, so now let's look at the key differences between these schools. And I'm going to look at what's good about each school and what's not so good about each school. Let's start with Harvard. Harvard is probably the most famous and prestigious of all the Ivy League universities. It's the oldest school uh, in the nation. Uh, and people from all over the world want to go to Harvard, right? Everyone wants to go to Harvard. And the benefit of Harvard is that it has uh, incredible teachers, right? All the professors are leaders in their field. Uh, it's got incredible resources because the school has the largest endowment of any university, about $50 billion. So if you decide, oh, I want to spend my summer in Africa, you know, working on this project, then Harvard will say, great, here's $50,000 to pay for that. There are so many clubs or so many opportunities or so many funding opportunities that the college has um, at your disposal that when you get in there, if you're ambitious, you're going to be like a kid in a candy store. But this comes with a bit of a price tag, and it's because the social climate at Harvard is not ideal. And I'm going to talk uh, and say some things that are generalizations, and of course you'll find exceptions to all these rules. But the Harvard uh, undergraduate student body is known for being uh, particularly um, uh, competitive um, and into social climbing. And what I mean by that is if you ever saw the movie, The Social Network, uh, you know, about Mark Zuckerberg and how he created Facebook on campus, Mark Zuckerberg was a campus who, who uh, Mark Zuckerberg was a student who was obsessed with his status on campus. He was obsessed with getting into one of these uh, elite final clubs, which is kind of the center for the social scene. And he was always trying to like do better. And then when he made his project, his Facebook, he just kind of like stepped on people and just did whatever was good for him. And that's kind of the knock against Harvard students. And again, of course, this isn't going to be everybody. There are some awesome students there. But a lot of students at Harvard are just so obsessively interested in their own careers that they pay no attention to anybody else. So it's not going to be one of those form, you know, warm and fuzzy college campuses where 
um, you know, everyone's going to help you and everything's going to be about the greater good in the community. Harvard is loaded with really bright, overachieving students who invest a lot of energy in themselves. And so you just need to know that when you go to Harvard, you're going to have incredible opportunities, great professors. When you graduate, everyone's going to want to take a meeting with you. But the students around you might not be uh, the warm, fuzzy type. They might be kind of cold. They, um, you know, the old joke about Harvard is that while they won't, you know, a Harvard student won't stick out his leg to trip you, he's not going to help you up either. So just be mindful of the fact that this is kind of like a cutthroat shark tank um, climate. And if you're the type of person who thrives in that pressure environment, great. But if you're someone who's a little more sensitive or is looking for more of like, you know, school spirit and collaboration and teamwork, uh, this is not the place for you. Okay, let's talk about Yale University now. Yale University is the second oldest Ivy behind Harvard, and it's often compared to Harvard. But Yale has really created um, uh, a name and a reputation for itself as the anti-Harvard. While Yaleys tend to think that Harvard students are stuffy and self-important and selfish, Yaleys pride themselves on being friendly and down to earth and accessible and just more fun. And the truth is that students at Yale, um, a disproportionate number of them are into creative things like singing, dancing, appearing, appearing in musicals, doing improv comedy, you know, in part because the, the famous drama school there. But it just kind of attracts students who are really kind of fun and quirky. Uh, they're definitely intellectual. Um, but they're not so uh, they're not so obsessed with like um, one upmanship and uh, competition and doing better than their peers. Of course, they're bright. Of course, they're competitive with themselves. Uh, but it's very different from Harvard in that it's not kind of like a me versus you mentality. It's more kind of like a collective us mentality. Um, and the other thing about Yale is uh, while they have world class professors and incredible courses. A lot of students complain that they just can't get into those classes. They have a shopping period where they can sit in and try them out, but they're always full. So that's one problem. And then the other thing about Yale, and this probably applies to Harvard too, is that uh, the campus is known for being very far left. And if this is your thing, then you're going to be in heaven. You know, everyone there is very progressive. Everyone's uh, fighting for social justice. Everyone's a social advocate for something. But if you're not really into that, then you may find that it's kind of like woke and politically correct. And that's kind of the ding against the student body at both Yale and Harvard is that those schools, and I'll throw Brown in that category as well, they're very radically liberal. And again, if that's your thing and those are your people or that's the type of environment that excites you, then you will be in heaven. But if you're more of a moderate, um, then some of the other Ivy League schools are probably a much better fit for you. Let's talk about Princeton. Princeton lately has been getting a uh, tremendous buzz for being the top ranked um, university in the nation and the top ranked Ivy. Uh, it's incredibly prestigious. It used to have this reputation for being very kind of snooty and rich and upper crust. And it still has a little bit of that reputation, but it's morphed over the past couple of decades into being students who are just hyper-focused and hyper-driven. When you meet students at Princeton, they always have one area where they excel. Like you could basically go to any dining hall at Princeton and saying, okay, you are the best in the nation at what? And seemingly everyone at Princeton will have an answer. I'm the best in the nation at chess. I was the best in the nation at hip hop dance, at science Olympiad, at lacrosse. Um, Princeton just attracts uh, uh, hyper overachievers. And the good part of that is that uh, the environment is really stimulating. Um, the professors are excellent. The undergraduate teaching at Princeton is famous. Uh, it's, you know, some of the best teaching anywhere. Um, but what goes along with that is the coursework is really hard. Uh, Princeton has a reputation for being probably the hardest Ivy League in terms of coursework. Um, your coursework is grueling. Students are endlessly working on homework. Uh, there's a lot of grade deflation. So students who are used to getting A's in high school, which they all did, are now getting B's and sometimes C's. Uh, it's really difficult. And you compare this with Yale or Harvard, where there's a lot of grade inflation, and 75% of students there are getting A's. 
Princeton is very different. If you get into Princeton, you're going to work your butt off. It's extremely hard. And the other thing to know about Princeton is that it's extremely competitive. The culture on campus is one where students are always comparing themselves against what other students are doing. You know, this one just got a great summer internship, and this one just got a great research opportunity, and this one has a job at the White House. There's so much pressure at Princeton to kind of keep up with the Joneses. And this doesn't really have uh, the same feel. Like Cornell is not like that. Dartmouth is not like that. Brown is not like that. But at Princeton, uh, it's packed with so many overachievers who are used to being the best at everything that's really developed this culture of intense or insane comparison. And even high achieving students uh, are always feeling like they're never doing enough. And so many students at Princeton kind of complain of feeling anxious and depressed and getting down on themselves. Because again, even though they're doing great, they feel like they're not doing enough when they compare themselves with their roommate or someone else in their dorm. So just be mindful that if you get into Princeton, it's an excellent school. It opens doors to all kinds of careers. It's got an incredible engineering program, right? A quarter of the students at Princeton are engineering majors, you know, world-class academics. But it's this crucible, it's this pressure cooker. And when you go to Princeton, you're probably going to feel like you're never doing enough. You're never studying enough. You're never pursuing your extracurriculars enough. You're never achieving enough. So it's just something to know. Let's talk about Dartmouth. Dartmouth College is different from the other Ivy League schools uh, in that it's the smallest of the bunch. It's only got 4,500 uh, undergraduates compared to about twice that for the other Ivy Leagues. And it's also located up in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. So that has a very different feel than if you went to school in the city, like at Harvard or Yale or UPenn or um, Columbia, right? So you go there because you want to kind of have a beautiful campus and you want to have a tight-knit community uh, and you want to have a focus on undergraduate teaching, not because you're looking for all the excitement and variety of a big city. So a benefit of Dartmouth is that seemingly all the students there are really warm and friendly and outgoing and outdoorsy. Um, and there's just, they like being a part of a community, right? There's so much school spirit at Dartmouth. So if you're looking for a, a family environment, it's a great place for you. But Dartmouth also has a really prominent um, Greek life. So if you're not into fraternities and sororities, you know, you might feel a little bit left out from that uh, because about two thirds of all students belong to one of those. And also you just have to remember that like Dartmouth uh, is cold and it's remote. So if you're looking to do uh, internships in a city or you need variety of stimulation, cultural opportunities, um, if you want to be somewhere where you can um, have access to job opportunities and do a lot of networking, that's much harder to do uh, at a place like Dartmouth. Let's talk about Cornell. So Cornell University is actually quite a bit like Dartmouth in the sense that it's remote. It's located in nature. It's beautiful. It's cold. Uh, it attracts people who like the outdoors. But Cornell is huge, whereas Dartmouth is small. Car Dar um, Cornell is the biggest Ivy League. Um, it has about 16,000 undergraduates, which is twice as much as the average. So it's huge. It's like a small city. Uh, some of the advantages of Cornell are that it, um, it has an excellent um, engineering program, uh, the best in the Ivy League, uh, and one of the top 10 best in the nation. And it also is broken up into so many different colleges. So when you apply to Cornell, you don't just apply to Cornell College, like you're applying to Yale or Brown or Dartmouth. You have to apply to a specific college within the university. And there's a bunch of them. There's engineering, there's computer science, there's um, public policy, there's agriculture, there's uh, labor. So there's all different kind of subsets to the university. And the good news there is that when you're at Cornell, you have access to all of those schools and all of those courses. So you can major in psychology, right, in the College of Arts and Sciences, but you can minor in um, urban design uh, from the School of Architecture. And that kind of access um, is really rare in the Ivy League. Like just to be able to have that many departments and that many courses available to you is what makes it great. Uh, but the con of Cornell, uh, one for a lot of people is just the location. It's just too gray and cold and remote. Uh, some people say that it's just too big. Uh, it's tough to navigate. You can kind of feel lost. 
There are too many courses to choose from, right? It doesn't kind of have that small campus feel. It, it does kind of feel like this major city. Um, and also one other thing is that Cornell has a little bit of a, an inferiority complex where uh, people say like, oh, Cornell's not a real Ivy and blah, blah, blah. Like, and of course that's nonsense. Uh, it's extremely prestigious, very difficult to get into. Um, when you graduate from Cornell, you have uh, access to the best graduate schools and you know the best corporate recruiting and everything. But it does get a little bit of that kind of reputation of being less prestigious. Um, and to be fair, uh, some of the other Ivies like Dartmouth and Brown, and sometimes UPenn get that a little bit as well. So let's talk about Brown University. Uh, Brown is uh, probably by far the most liberal of all the Ivy League schools. It, it tends to attract people who are uh, leftist and progressive and uh, embrace a more alternative lifestyle. Um, the school paper did a, uh, a survey recently that found that uh, uh, almost 40% of all students at Brown identify as LGBTQ. So it's a very progressive school. Um, and what's different about Brown than all the other Ivy Leagues is that it has something called an open curriculum. And that means you don't have any course requirements whatsoever. You can take whatever classes you want for all four years there and then graduate with a Brown degree. And all the other Ivies are very different from that. They, they have uh, specific uh, distribution requirements that you have to take to get kind of this well-rounded liberal arts education. Brown takes a different approach. It says, we trust you as students. We're going to let you kind of design your own education and pick and choose what you want to study. And on top of that, they even go one step further and they say, in fact, you can take any of these classes pass-fail as you want. And the idea there is they want to encourage students to explore topics and to take a class that maybe is really difficult, like aeronautical engineering or something that's out of their wheelhouse, like, you know, applied math or whatever it is, um, without worrying about this is going to tank my GPA. So, you know, Brown kind of has this uh, innovative way of looking at education, which is to say that we trust you, we trust that you'll know what you want to study, and we trust that you'll make good decisions about what you want to take for grades and what you want to take pass fail. And probably the only con about Brown would be uh, if you're a student who just doesn't do well in this kind of loose, unstructured environment. Um, you know, some students really like going to a school where things are kind of laid out for them and they know certain distribution requirements they have, they have to take. And Brown is really just the opposite. It's kind of like you can do whatever you want. Um, and the other thing about Brown is there's not a lot of school spirit. It really has a reputation for um, a social scene where everyone kind of just does their own thing. There's no uh, strong Greek system. There's no strong uh, social center to the campus. It's one of those things where, you know, students at Brown tend to be very, uh, they're independent thinkers. They think outside the box, but they also just kind of do their own thing. So if you're looking for this kind of uh, tight knit community, uh, the kind of campus spirit you might find at Cornell or Dartmouth, uh, that doesn't really exist at Brown. Let's talk about Columbia. Columbia is known for being in the heart of New York City, or at least uh, close to the heart of New York City. It's on the Upper West Side. And what that means is that when you go to Columbia, you have the entire city as your campus, which is great. If that's what you're looking for, that type of stimulation, cultural opportunities, plays, sporting events, musical events, restaurants, like you name it, New York has everything. And it's also incredibly diverse. Um, you know, in, in New York, you find people from all backgrounds and cultures and walks of life. And so that's part of your campus experience. Now, Columbia actually does have its own really small campus. It's self-contained and it's, it's quite beautiful and it's quite safe on campus. But really, students venture off campus all the time to go into New York City. And the great thing about New York is it's, it's everything you can possibly ask for. Uh, but the only thing about New York City is it's kind of dirty. Uh, it can be kind of dangerous and it can definitely get expensive. So if all of your uh, entertainment options are off campus, um, that can start to eat into your wallet. The important thing to know about Columbia is that it has a really rigorous uh, core curriculum. And that means that you have to take a lot of classes that are designated by the school. And they tend to be um, kind of like uh, classic courses in Western thought, uh, Western government, art, music. Columbia really wants to make sure that when you graduate, re regardless of what you major in, you really have this strong foundation in critical thinking and Western thought so that you can hold your own in any conversation. 
and uh, students at Columbia kind of have a love-hate relationship with this. On the one hand, they really appreciate the fact that they're learning about this uh, essential information and that a lot of these courses are small, like 20-person seminars, so you get into these great debates with your classmates. Uh, but on the other hand, it can eat into your schedule where, you know, sometimes as much as half of your um, half of your uh, space may be taken up by these core classes. So you don't have as much flexibility to kind of like, oh, I want to try that class and try that class or that class. You know, it's really the opposite of Brown in that way, where at Brown, you can kind of like whimsically pick and choose whatever courses interest you that semester. At Columbia, you're kind of locked into this track and you really need to take a, 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 a large number of courses that all your other classmates will be taking too. So it's both good and bad in that way. And the other thing to know about Columbia is that it's a very intellectual atmosphere. It's a very rigorous atmosphere. The courses are hard. The professors are hard. Students work themselves to the bone, much like they do at Princeton. Um, and also there's really no sense of community at um, Columbia as compared to some of the other schools, again, like uh, Dartmouth or Yale or Cornell. Columbia uh, students kind of do their own thing. There's no strong cultural center. Uh, there are fraternities and sororities, but they're off campus and um, they're not very popular. So I guess the comp a complaint that a lot of uh, Columbia students have is that we love New York City. You know, we love our professors, but the downside is the work is really hard and there's just not a real sense of community and everyone ends up kind of doing their own thing. Let's look at UPenn. UPenn is kind of pre-professional paradise. And what I mean by that is that it seems like everyone who goes to UPenn is hyper-focused on their career and, and kind of like making that career happen right away. So students at UPenn are extremely involved in kind of career clubs like investment clubs or pre-med clubs or whatever ha they happen to be going into. And it just uh, it creates this really competitive atmosphere where if, if you don't feel like um, you're putting in enough to your career, even if you're just a freshman or a sophomore, then you're going to feel like you're getting left behind. Because at UPenn, everyone is just gunning to get that uh, summer internship and that job next year. Everyone is hyper-focused on career to the point where uh, it can feel like uh, you're, you're not doing enough. The other thing to know about Penn is that similar to Cornell, when you apply, you don't just apply to UPenn, you apply to one of the colleges at the university. Uh, so it might be the Business School Wharton or Penn Engineering um, or the College of Liberal Arts. Um, but you have to kind of choose what you want to do. And the good part of that is you get to take courses from all the different schools. So, you know, you might be a music major or a philosophy major but you can still take business classes at Wharton, um, which are taught by you know, some of the best professors in the nation. And one of the areas where Penn really excels in, is in this uh, career development. So they have so many clubs that are focused on helping you build your career, like consulting groups or, um, uh, or uh, competitions where you can pitch a pilot idea to help the surrounding Philadelphia community. And then if you win, you're given $100,000 and uh, and some classmates on your team, and then they're like, go, you have one year to kind of uh, put this project into place and kind of um, evaluate it. So they're really looking to build entrepreneurs and leaders, um, and everything is kind of geared towards that. So the advantage with UPenn is that there's tremendous opportunities for uh, career development, um, internships, research, career clubs, all that stuff. The downside is that it can feel like you're never doing enough. And there's actually a condition at Penn called Penn Face, uh, which is where students um, on the surface look like everything is going great, but underneath they're just dying. They're just crumbling because they feel like they're not doing enough. And that's kind of, that's kind of Penn in a nutshell. It's this hyper-competitive environment where everyone is doing more than you, um, and you kind of feel like you have to kind of keep up appearances um, or else you kind of fall apart. So in summary, I would say this. Yes, there are some major similarities between the eight Ivy League universities. They're all prestigious. They're all difficult to get into. And if you go to any of them, you'll be set up for success in life. 
but you have to know the differences between them. Uh, and you need to go on their website and look at the academic differences between them, between the different programs they have to offer, the different departments, uh, the different opportunities they have. And then you also have to understand the cultural differences because you really wanna go someplace where you fit in and you're happy. Uh, four years is a big chunk of your life. You know, you're gonna make some lifelong friends there. Um, and it's really gonna have a big impact on, on the career you pursue and kind of the person you become. So don't just pick an Ivy League school because you think, oh, this one's rated a little bit better. They're all excellent. You know, find the one that feels like home. And if you get a chance to visit them on campus, that's great because you can talk to people, walk around and see where you feel at home. Um, and if you can't, also you can go and take a virtual tour of the different campuses and just spend some time on their websites. You know, they have different students uh, who have blogs and you'll get a feel for the mentality of life on campus. What are students there into? What are they like? What types of students does this school tend to attract? And you wanna go someplace where you'll be happy.